Well, good morning, Covenant. Good morning. Awesome. Welcome, everyone, to another Sunday here. I will be your host today. Uh, I am in a, oh, we got the groans. Is that, oh, no. Uh, I am in a program uh, called the, uh, through the Denver Presbytery, called the uh, Commission Pastor Program, Commission Lay Pastor Program, Commission Ruling Elder Program. It's changed names like six times since I've been in it. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the idea is I go through training, I uh, go through schooling, I go through different things, and the Presbytery looks at me, checks me off, and say, we trust Alex uh, to run certain things. Uh, I know I would be laughing too. Uh, so, uh, but eventually one day they will say they trust me. So here we are. Uh, and speaking of that, um, if you trust that you're going to lunch after service, and uh, uh, why don't you go ahead and bring CJ to lunch. Uh, CJ, uh, we have a sign up in the back. You can take CJ to lunch, bring him out somewhere. You can cook for him at your home, and then he'll need a ride back to his place. You can sign up in the lobby for that. Um, we have, this morning, you probably all saw it. Uh, there was much confusion about it, and Ruth is fumbling with it as we speak. But uh, yeah, Emily's got one too. Uh, we are doing uh, over here, uh, Danny has been putting together a blessing of the stuffies for the wee preschool that meets here every week. So we are going to, uh, Danny and I, in a few weeks, we're going to bless their stuffed animals. And uh, those little cute, uh, you know, fabrics are the sleeping bags that we're going to be putting them in. Uh, so... If you feel like you're able to uh, and want to have a little something to fidget with during a service, uh, feel free. Uh, they're meant to be sleeping bags. You don't have to do it perfectly or, you know, uh, however you do it's going to be great. Uh, uh, but listen, I'll say this, all right? Adults in this room have said, man, I wish I could have a kid's table in the back, all right? Uh, so if you want something to do to, uh, you know, as you're sitting there, uh, you can fidget with some, uh, some, some fabric. Um, uh, listen, uh, we haven't highlighted it in a bit, but I do want to share, and I think it's important, that uh, our covenant covered, serving every week, last week served 162 families, and the numbers up to date are 5,813 families, uh, uh, and two total of 22,550 members in families year to date. Uh, that's truly incredible, truly wild. So thank you for all those who invest in it, and uh, thank you to Dave for helping run it. Um, all right, folks, let's get into it. Uh, let's get the reason that we're all here. Hymn number 450, if you want to join us in worship this morning. <laughs>
Oh, well, join me now is the time and place for the confession. We'll open the front page of our bulletin and we'll go through this together. We confess the times we have felt trapped by our choices and our disobedience. We confess our reluctance to turn to you in our darkest times. Forgive us for our hesitance to seek your mercy and embrace your deliverance. We confess our need for transformation and renewal. Forgive us for resisting the change of our hearts through your grace. Take a few seconds for some silent meditation. In this silence, let us open our hearts to the transforming grace that meets us in our deepest need. We are forgiven, we are renewed, we are embraced by grace and given strength to transform. Awesome. <clears throat> well, that's normal time in our worship service for our kids' blessing. No kids this Sunday, that's all right though. Um, We'll do our normal blessing all together. You all know it. Let's do it. God includes me. God includes you. God includes all of us. Lovely. Uh, if you all want to stand and pass the peace of Christ to one another, the biggest question this fall, pizza or pasta, what do you enjoy? Oh. <laughs> See you come in. Welcome. I guess I said we were all fun. I don't know. I see Jake. I don't know. I
going to help me with uh, our scripture reading today. So, from one of the most authoritative, goofy, let me get this on for you. Uh, Bob, how would you describe your voice? Deep and melodious. Deep and melodious. Uh, let's hear the, the word of the Lord this morning. Okay, we're looking at Jonah. And he's been swallowed up. And this is his prayer from the belly of the fish. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet, you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord. And my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. When I have vowed, I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. And then the Lord spoke, and it spewed forth Jonah on the dry land. Amen. The word of the Lord.
know there was this much weeping and gnashing of teeth today. Hello, everyone! Hello. Oh my goodness, finally! Thank the Lord we're here. We are in a sermon series about the book of Jonah. This sermon series, I think, holds a record for the longest sermon titles in covenant history. Take a look at that sermon title and behold. Uh, through the month of October, we're going through the short prophetic book and seeing how we can't step into the stories and find ourselves reflected in this old tale. And I've been sitting and meditating on the chapter we have today. I've been gnawing on it. It's been in my stomach. And let me tell you, it hasn't felt just right. And I couldn't figure out why until I found myself challenged by a book uh, by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Ta-Nehisi Coates is an American author and journalist whose books include Between the World and Me and We Were Eight Years in Power. And he has a most recent book called The Message. And The Message has been making the news recently, and I think Coates is a captivating voice. So I grabbed the audiobook and I started listening. And the challenge is simple. His book, kind of summed down to really one idea, is that the stories we tell shape the futures we want. The stories we tell shape the futures we want. Meaning, we often tell stories or share anecdotes, and they all frame things in a certain light, so we can try to get a future we want out of that story. For instance, when I was a kid, I had a friend who I was always jealous of. He was always better than me at sports, and, uh, and so a moment came up where I lied. He said, man, you know, I wish I had an Xbox. And I was like, that's pretty crazy, because uh, I actually have an Xbox. <laughs> the story I was lying about, but ultimately telling, is that I have an Xbox. And I told it because the future I wanted was for my friend to be jealous of me. And in chapter 2 of Jonah, we have a story that ultimately makes me uncomfortable. And it's because of the implications of the story being told. And what's strange about chapter 2 is it has to be the most skipped over chapter in the book of Jonah. We love the part where Jonah runs from God. We love the part of Jonah with the whale, which gets like three verses. And uh, the redemption of Nineveh. And I think we skipped over chapter two, because I think we're reading it wrong. And I think we've been told it wrong. And uh, I think that's why we're reading it wrong. So let me explain. You see, Jonah's goal is laid out in verse 3 of chapter 1, right? Jonah says, right, uh, 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 um, but Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah wants to flee the presence of the Lord. So, God wants to redeem the people of Nineveh, those murderers, those destroyers of the temple, those evil people, not on my watch. Here's my plan. I'll run, and I'll go as far away as I can, which, for how Jonah understood God, isn't a bad plan, all right? For the ancient Israelites, God is very central. God is stationary. Uh, we kind of think about God in all and through all, uh, but that's not how the ancient Israelites would have understood God. You want to be in the presence of God, you go to the temple, or you go up to the height of a mountain. You don't go on a mid-level hike and see beautiful trees. You don't find a cool piece of toast where you think Jesus' face is burnt in the toast. Yahweh is in the temple, and Yahweh is up on high places. Let's remember, Moses didn't find God in the valley with the people. Moses had to go up on Mount Sinai to 
find God. So, God is up. So what's Jonah going to do? Jonah's going to go down. And he goes down. And so in Jonah, we get a series of downward movements. Uh, it starts in, uh, in verse 3. It says, so he went down to Joppa. All right? We get our first downward movement. And then the second comes in verse 5. The sailors are afraid for their lives. And Jonah is down in the hold of the ship. The teller of this satirical story is painting a picture that the ancient people would have understood. Jonah is escaping God. Jonah is going down. And up until this point, this is a great start to Jonah's plan, to be truly and fully honest. Like, if I were Jonah, I'd be really confident about how this is going. Uh, I'm going down, away from God. And even though I'm going down, I'm still relatively safe, right? I'm in the hold of a ship, and I'm about as far down as you can go in the, where I can be safe. Because the next step down, away from God, is so wildly unsafe. You see, it's helped us for, to know a little bit about ancient cosmology. So we talked about God is up. God is up and on high places, so we need to know what they thought of was down. So they talk about down as the pit, or Sheol. And Sheol for ancient Israelites was just a place after death, right? And Sheol is for everyone, so basically it is death, all right? It doesn't matter if you were righteous, it doesn't matter if you were wicked. Everyone goes to Sheol. And Sheol is about as far down as they could imagine. In Isaiah, Sheol is described as under the earth. In Job, Sheol is described as under the mountain. And in Amos, Sheol is just far from heaven. Theologian Emil Hirsch writes, Sheol is a horrible, dreary, dark, disorderly land. Yet, it is the appointed house for all the living, and return from Sheol is not expected. And here's where I think the typical story of Jonah has been told to us incorrectly. And here's why I think we miss something so important in chapter 2. Jonah has gone about as far down as he can safely, and then he gets thrown into the unsafe. He gets thrown into the sea. And I think here's what we typically get from the story of Jonah. Jonah gets thrown into the sea. Large fish swallows him as sort of a time-out effort from God. Uh, and then we skip over chapter 2, and ah! He gets spit back up to dry land, and now we can get to the cool parts of the story. But chapter 2... We get Jonah describing for us what happened before the fish. The large fish isn't just a time out for disobeying God. The large fish is God delivering Jonah from death itself. The sailors toss him overboard, and down, down, down he goes. And how far down does he go? Well, chapter 2 tells us. You cast me into the deep, the heart of the seas, reeds wrapped around my head at the root of the mountain. And most importantly, Jonah was in the belly of Sheol, in the land of the dead, whose bars closed upon me forever. Jonah's thankfulness and experiences of deliverance come from the belly because of where he had been. Which means chapter 2 of Jonah is saying something so wildly profound about God. The testimony of chapter 2 of Jonah is God is not just up. God is not some God who's only on top of a mountain. God is not some God who's only found in the temple. 
The profound thing that Jonah claims here is there is no depth that you can go to where God cannot reach you. You can go to death itself. In the belly of Sheol, and God will send a large fish to rescue you from it. And as I meditated upon that point, I felt uncomfortable. Because surface level, that's great news, right? God is with me and looking to deliver me whenever I stop running from God. Which I run a lot, so. And the message is good, right? That even as Jonah was delivered from Sheol, where nobody is to return, even those we think who are beyond redemption can be delivered by God. But I can't escape the day and age in which we live and the history that's come before me in the present I'm in now. That I struggle with the realities of the idea of redemption and deliverance, especially for those whom I don't think deserve. And that might sound harsh, but I bet if we took a few minutes here this Sunday, you might be able to think of someone or some situation in which you believe the right course of action is a harsh and final judgment. We have tragedies going on around the world and that have gone on in this very country and that influence how we understand the message of deliverance and redemption. And so I wrestled and I struggled this week to deliver a message that I felt could accurately re represent what I feel but also honors the text that I'm reading. And Coates' book challenged me to adjust the lens a bit so that I might be able to better listen to this story. The stories we tell shape the futures we want. And that's what's powerful about the book of Jonah. You see, we have a nice, neat Bible, right? It's translated into a language that we understand. It's organized in a way that we can understand it. But that wasn't always true. Ancient Israelites, who had come back from exile from the Assyrians, those Ninevites, who came through, wrecked their land, wrecked their temple, uh, uh, indoctrinated them into a new way of living, some came back. And they had to pick up the pieces. So they had to tell stories. Stories of where they came from that they might inform who they want to be. And there are tons of stories about justice and judgment. Read any of the other prophetic books, right? They're like, God's going to give it to the Assyrians. Don't you worry about that. There will be a harsh and final judgment. And then tucked away in the middle of these books, about judgment, is a book about radical grace. And not just for anyone, for the Assyrians themselves. Which means for hundreds of years, ancient Israelite people verbally told the story of Jonah. They told this as sort of a counterbalance. They felt that this story was important enough to tell, not just once, but for generations. And then it got written down, and they said, we want to keep the story in for generations. Because I bet they could feel that they may, it may be shaping a future that they want. When we tell only stories of revenge and anger and judgment, we shape a future of that. And we use those stories to justify those actions. And maybe they could, could see a future with their kids and grandkids of violence and action. And so they want to tell a story to shape a future they want. A future of peace, of hope, and deliverance, not only for ourselves, but for our worst enemies. So I come here today with no great thoughts on justice and judgment in the light of redemption and deliverance, 
But I do know this. Our ancient ancestors kept this story within the confines of the pages of our Bible. A story sharing about how Jonah, even in the pits of Sheol, the pits of death, could be redeemed. And if there's redemption for me, and if there's redemption for you, then there's redemption for all of us. God has the ability to deliver anyone. And so, which means I can't love people where I want them to be. I have to love people who they are now. And if you want to come along with me on that journey of redemption and deliverance, I invite you to stand.
continue to be a community that not only impacts those inside of our church, but Lord, continue to impact and show your love to those outside of our walls. And uh, may we do that. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Would you all stand for the doxology? CJ is very excited about it, and he asks for prayers for staying together. Uh, you know, as, a, as relationships are tricky, relationships are tough. We have a lot of people in this congregation 
who have been in very long-term relationships. And so I wondered if we could, even just for a minute here, give CJ some communal wisdom. Um, uh, let's give CJ some top three things that help a relationship last long. Who's got any thoughts? Communication. Oh, wait, say it again. Communication. And say it again. Communication. Hey, we're communicating a lot of communication. Absolutely, that's a good one. Talk it out. Talk it out, more communication, yeah. Be kind. Kindness, huge. Grace, some kindness, absolutely. Honor is the end, love is kind, love is patient. Absolutely, love is kind, love is patient. That's great, ancient wisdom. One more thing, anything else? Forgiveness, thank you, Shane. Yeah, and forgiveness. That sometimes we don't understand each other, right? So it takes time to talk to one another and then forgive one another. I love that. Uh, we're going to pray for Dave and Kareem this morning as well. Uh, praise for their friend Ken as the, they navigate the next steps for care and treatments following Ken's cancer surgery. Uh, absolutely. And uh, Bob uh, uh, saying, let's lift up uh, those affected by the hurricanes, uh, my grandmother being one of them. So, um, if you want to join me in uh, prayer today. God, we have many things in our hearts and on our minds, and you know those things. You know those things deeply, and you know them well. And Lord, here's the things that we come to you today with, God. We lift up CJ um, in the midst of a relationship, God. And we pray uh, that uh, they communicate well, uh, that they have humility, that there is love and uh, understanding between them, Lord. Uh, we pray for Ken and the family members uh, navigating cancer surgery. God, it's a scary time. We pray for those doctors. We pray for the radiologists. We pray for everyone involved. And God, our nation has just been swept by massive uh, hurricanes that have left a wake of destruction and the, the destructive people in their wake. God, we lift up those people and may those people find community. May they find help and assistance and uh, in the wake of a natural disaster. And God, when our life feels like a disaster, may we have written on our hearts the words of your Lord's Prayer as we say it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.
be well with others as well. Find redemption, find deliverance, not only for yourselves, but even those who you don't think deserve it. Go well, church. Thank you.